Welcome to Mexico. I'm John Chatterton. And this is the entrance to a cenote. Now, cenote is a water-filled cave. Here in the Yucatan Peninsula, there's hundreds, maybe even thousands of them. Nobody knows for sure. But we've heard about a cenote on the island of Cozumel that's special. In it are artifacts from Mayan civilization. But they're not right by the entrance to the cenote. They're more than a mile back into the underwater cave system. So how did they get there? Well, I'm not a cave diver. If I'm going to investigate this mystery, I'm going to have to use special training, and I'm going to have to use special equipment. Now, if I've got to go through all this to get to the site of these relics, then how did the ancient Mayans leave evidence of their civilization more than one mile back into an underwater cave system? The cave system of Cueva Cabrada extends for miles under the island of Cozumel, just off the east coast of the Yucatan Peninsula. For years, Cozumel has been a mecca for sport divers who flock here to visit one of the largest coral reefs on the planet. What's less well known is that there is a maze of underwater caves that snakes through the rock under the island. Because of the danger, only a handful of highly trained experts have ever been inside. Jeff Bozanik is a cave explorer who has spent over 20 years mapping the cave systems that lay beneath Cozumel. I've been diving in Cueva Quebrada since 1984. With a small team of about a dozen people, we have spent about a thousand man dives into this cave system. We've explored almost six miles in Cueva Quebrada. We've had the challenge and the work and the ecstasy of exploring new cave passages that nobody's ever seen before. Six miles of dark and twisting cave passages is a lot for a novice cave diver. If I'm going to help Jeff unravel this mystery, I need to find out about previously explored sites in the Cueva Cabrada system. In the early 1980s, Jeff and his partner, Steve Omerod, explored a site called The Well. We had been doing exploration work in this portion of the cave, and I started looking around and noticed that some of the rocks appeared to be more rounded than one would normally expect in this type of a cave. And so when I actually turned things over, this is what we found. What Jeff finds is completely unexpected. Ancient Mayan artifacts not seen by human eyes in over 1,000 years. Ceramic pots and bowls, sea tortoise shells, and conch shells that could only have been placed here by man. And perhaps the most shocking discovery of all, human remains. When I first saw that skull staring at me, my first thought was, oh my god, why is that there? Maybe it was a burial site, and we have seen burial sites in other caves in other parts of the world. We still don't know. It's still a mystery. So this is a very rich archaeological find in this cave. Well, nobody had ever found this type of material in any cenote on Cozumel before. In the 1990s, Jeff and Steve explore another part of the cave, a location they call the Blind Fish Site, a passage so deep in Cueva Cabrada that no one has ever been back to fully explore it. That is where we want to go, to investigate the mystery that they uncovered. We found another site with a significant amount of archaeological remains of artifacts of all different types, way back in the cave system. We're talking almost a mile from the ocean entrance. And the thing about this site is we don't know how they got there. There's no surface opening there. You, experienced cave explorers, are barely able to, to carry enough equipment to get that far back in the system. There's no way that ancient Mayans could have swum this stuff back from the way that you guys are going in. There's absolutely no possibility whatsoever, and that's what we're here to do on this expedition, is we're going to try and determine why this is here and how it got there. Well, stuff that we've got to address here is, first of all, this is some very serious cave diving. This is almost a mile from the beach. The scuba technology that you guys have been using to get back there 
you guys are really pushing the envelope. You're really kind of at the limit. You just can't really carry much more in the way of tanks. Now, I know we've got a plan to get back in there. We're going to use some technology. And I look at these photographs. This is some payoff. Mayan civilization flourishes from 1500 BC to 1500 AD, when the Spanish first arrive in Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula. The conquistadors find a complex civilization with large and sophisticated cities that extend through present-day Honduras, El Salvador, Guatemala, Belize, and Mexico. The Maya in the area of northern Yucatan really begin to floresce after 500 AD. Oh, this was a major civilization. Huge centers, cities with public buildings, developed kingship, nobility, a class structure, important sporting events, stadia that hosted these things. They are the one culture in the New World that there is absolutely no question, but these people did have a fully efficient writing system. Ancient Mayan art depicts warfare, kings, gods, spirits, and human sacrifice. Most people tend to picture human sacrifice in terms of heart extraction, which is so famous. But the Maya were a very inventive people, and they had any number of ways of killing people. We have sacrifice by arrows. They use um, a arrowing uh, people, killing uh, in their chest with arrows. They use also the decapitation. Also, they practice the disemboweling of bodies no? with uh, obsidian knives. Uh, basically taking out all the intestines and all the, all the forms, and, and, and that was another way to, to produce a lot of blood. Though humans were the ultimate sacrifice, cenotes reveal that Mayans offered other important objects to the gods. We've found a whole range of artifacts in the cenotes, including gold and jade, pottery, Copal incense that has been beautifully preserved. Are the artifacts that Jeff Bozanik and his team find related to ancient Mayan ritual? Are they sacred offerings to the gods, carefully placed deep in a water-filled cave some 1,000 years ago? Or could there be another explanation? Archaeologists are just beginning to understand the relationship between the Mayans and their religious and spiritual relationship to the cenotes. Now behind me you can see the Casa del Cenote. This was a temple that they built atop of this well right here. Now of course, this would be the place where they'd bring their offerings to the gods. That's because the cenote was the entrance to the underworld. Well, the thing I'm interested in doing is see in the underworld. We're on the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico, preparing to dive one of the most dangerous and mysterious realms on the planet, the Cenote, doorway to a water-filled underworld. Inside one of these caves, Cueva Cabrada on the island of Cozumel, are artifacts and human remains. Remnants of Mayan civilization present here over a thousand years ago. But how did the Mayans get them there? Almost a mile back from the entrance, deep in an inaccessible cave. That's what we want to know. To find out, I'm going to have to learn a brand new discipline, cave diving. I've been a hard hat diver for more than 20 years. That's how I earn my living. And I've got 25 years of experience on diving shipwrecks. Regardless of all that experience, cave diving is an extreme discipline, and it requires education, training. So my cave diving instructor is Jeff Bozanik. He's a guy that really knows this area and knows cave diving. 
Jeff, what is it about the cenotes? What are they exactly? Well, what we're looking at here, this entire jungle is underlain by underground rivers. Underneath all of these woods, rivers are flowing out towards the ocean. Nothing flows on the surface. They form cave systems underground, and these cenotes, or this lake that we're looking at, is where the ceiling has collapsed into the passage underground, and that allows us to be able to swim into the cave system. Jeff, wh where is it we're actually going to enter into the cave? Well, where we're going to go in that cave entrance starts right underneath this rock overhang right oh, here. Sure. So okay, we're going right to go there. down a crevice there, and then we'll get to horizontal passage. It continues on underground. We're going to start here because this is an easier environment to learn in than Cueva Quebrada. We've got all the pottery and the religious artifacts over there, and it's a hard environment to work in. We don't know how they got there, but we need to get you prepped before we can bring you in there to be able to look to see what's going on. Well, I'll tell you, Cueva Quebrada is a big dive, but we got to do the work so that we can get into that system, do what we got to do there. But right now, you and I got to get busy. Cave diving is not for the faint of heart. It's dark, it's dangerous, and even experienced cave divers die each year. See anything? No. To get ready for the big dive, Jeff leads me through several days of rigorous training on land and in the water. I've got to master a unique set of skills. Learning how to set and secure a line, using special fin techniques to preserve the cave environment and visibility, and figuring out how to find my way out of a cave if I ever lose the line that leads back to the entrance. I think you have to put forth the effort to learn this stuff. It's not easy all running around blindfolded, tripping, bumping it. I think I got one here from the coconut palm. You are going to remember what happened in that particular exercise, and then you're much more likely to follow that procedure when you're inside the cave, and your life really is dependent on it. I'm really learning how to do this with the least amount of risk in making a very serious cave dive. Another key to managing the risk is to use the latest in dive technology. On this trip, the entire team will be diving with advanced rebreathers, which will allow the team to have more diving time in the caves and more air in the event of an emergency. Rebreathers operate on a principle that's been around since the 1800s and used for years on submarines. They chemically scrub the carbon dioxide from our exhaled gas, allowing us to rebreathe the same gas over and over again. Modern rebreathers are just beginning to be used in cave dives. Just learning how to use these rebreathers takes years of experience, but everyone in our team is already fully qualified. I'm with Mike Fowler. He's with Silent Diving Systems, and he's an expert on the Inspiration Rebreather. Mike, what advantages is a rebreather going to give me in the cave diving environment? Okay, there are several advantages. Uh, one of the simple advantages is just the lack of bubbles with a closed circuit rebreather. When you're swimming through the cave, you're not uh, disturbing any sediment that may be in the cracks and crevices along the walls. With open circuit, you've got lots of bubbles that are floating to the ceiling that can actually damage the cave environment. So ecologically, it's more sound in that you're not going to cause damage. Absolutely. What else? A rebreather, like the Inspiration, is a gas management tool. The very two small little tanks that we carry will give you anywhere between a six and an 11 hour duration. So for example, based on a six hour duration, then the two small tanks that we've got on the Inspiration are equivalent on a 30 foot dive to seven 80 cubic foot tanks. On a 100 foot dive, you're looking at 13 80 cubic foot tanks. And if you go to 250 feet, you're looking at somewhere in the region of 27 80 cubic foot tanks. Now, of course, you and I would never intentionally plan to do a dive with that kind of duration. But it's nice to know that if you get yourself in trouble, you've got that time to sort out your problems, whatever they might be. That gives you a big advantage. One thing is certain. However the ancient Mayans managed to put the artifacts a mile inside Cueva Cabrada, they definitely didn't have this sort of advanced equipment. I am finally ready for my first cave dive. Jeff Bozanek has selected a relatively easy but spectacular cavern dive called Dos Ojos, Spanish for two eyes. Okay. Let's go over just a brief review of the hazards that we're going to try and work around. First off, we're in an overhead environment. 
we can't go to the surface if we need to, if we have a failure. Secondly, we're going to have a lot of silt on the bottom. The rebreathers will help because there won't be any bubbles knocking silt off the ceiling and coming down. But we still need to worry about proper fitting techniques. Right. We have in these caves a lot of very fragile, delicate geological formations called stalactites and stalagmites that took millions of years to form. All it takes is one simple push, and those will come toppling over. Is anything new? Is there anything I'm going to see that we haven't covered? The one thing you haven't seen before that we talked about briefly is that throughout this entire cave system is what's called the halocloin. And a halocloin is a difference in salinity in a very short distance. We actually have two different water masses sitting on top of each other, fresh above salt. And when we swim through that interface, the waters are going to mix and the visibility is going to get very poor. Should we get our gear ready? Let's go. This is going to be a great time. Now that I'm seeing this strange new world for the first time, I understand why the Maya think underwater caves are a spiritual place. The underwater caves were very important for the Mayas because the water inside the cave, it's like the door to the underworld, but also it was a place for, for life, for birth, or rebirth. And there were special ceremonies and uh, gods, deities, spirits lived there. It's a place where life started, but also where life ends. The sources uh, of life were provided by the water, the only available water that was in the area. So when there was a drought or a special event uh, that gave instability to the life of the Mayas in the region, they made sacrifices to get more fertility. You know, so they dedicated those uh, to the water. Are the artifacts at Cueva Cabrada offerings to the underworld gods? What are we going to find when we get to the blind fish site? I'm in the middle of my first training dive when Jeff decides to throw me a curveball. He turns out the lights just to see how well I cope. Keep calm, John. Just hold on to the line. How am I going to get out of this cave in the dark? I'm pretty sure that the line is right over here. Under the Mexican island of Cozumel, a river deep inside a winding cave called Cueva Cabrada. Divers make an amazing discovery in 1991. Ancient Mayan artifacts and a human skull. I see you To prepare for the Cueva Cabrada dive, I'm practicing a lights out emergency drill with my cave instructor, Jeff Bozan. Even with 25 years of wreck diving experience and days of cave training, the underground world is a very hazardous environment. When you are diving a shipwreck, you are constantly in touch with the wreck itself. But in cave diving, you never place your hands anywhere. One little touch can cause rock formations to crumble. And in a cave, going directly to the surface is simply not an option because you've got a stone ceiling overhead at all times. So the most important test is to keep track of your guideline. Keep in contact with it at all times. It's your lifeline, your only way out. Whew. That was some dive. I'll tell you what, when you first get in there, it's a lot. You know, all the rock formation and everything else. 
It certainly was uh, impressive, but it's also, I thought it would be much more like, uh, uh, like a roadway, you know? And it's not at all. Oh, there's passages that just go off every place. Yeah, but even trying to determine where there are passages and stuff isn't easy. I'll tell you what, I'm looking at this, and, and still, this is just our getting ready for the big dive. Well, this is the tip of the iceberg. The distance that we went in here is a tenth of what we're going to end up doing when we go to Quebrada. But at Quebrada, how did all that stuff get so far back in the cave? I, I mean, here we are. I got a rebreather, we got communications, we've got bailout sellers, we got all this stuff, and we didn't go nearly as far as we're gonna have to go. Well, that's it. the mystery, and that's what we're here to try and find out, isn't it? Well, I'll tell you what, we gotta be ready, or we're not gonna figure out anything. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, thanks a lot. That was a great time. That was a great time. You guys are okay? All this training so I can help solve the mystery of how and why Mayan artifacts were placed at a site called Blind Fish, deep inside the Cueva Cabrada over 1,000 years ago. I'm atop the tallest pyramid in the Yucatan, and all around here are the ruins of the ancient Mayan city of Coba. Now, 1,200 years ago, there were some 55,000 people who lived in this city. And they didn't live here in isolation. Uh, they were linked to all of the other Mayan population centers in the area by a network of roads. Now, the Mayans built these roads so that they would have a trade route. Another reason why these roads were so important was that the Mayans would go on pilgrimage for their religion. Now, where were all these Mayan pilgrims going? Their holiest of holy places? Cozumel. The Cueva Quebrada at uh, Cozumel would have been particularly sacred because the entire island was sacred. The visitation was on such a scale that special roads were created across the Yucatan Peninsula that would end up on the coast just off the island. Cozumel was a very special site. It was a pilgrimage site. People were coming from far away, from the Gulf of Mexico all the way, or from Honduras, to, to see the Ixel goddess. Each shell is the moon goddess, a weather goddess, the goddess of fertility and childbirth and medicine. She is believed to live in water-filled caves on Cozumel, and it is here that Mayans place their offerings to her. We know that the moon goddess was particularly the goddess that one prayed to for children. And so it may have been that barren women were coming to the island asking for help in becoming pregnant. The goddess Ixchel, and is strongly linked to water because she can control the sources of water in the underground. And that's why sometimes she is linked also to forces of death. Are the artifacts at Cueva Cabrada sacrifices intended to please the goddess Ixchel? Archaeologists have given us some clues to look for once we get to the blind fish site. I see a couple of tip-offs that we are dealing with something related to ritual rather than simply to the retrieving of water because there are cenotes that are used as water sources and you will get a lot of broken pottery that were simply bo uh, broken water jars. There are pots that have been found by the Mexican archaeologists that have kill holes in them. And those are holes that were deliberately knocked in the vessel by the Maya to essentially make them useless, to make them as an offering in ritual. So that's something that is, again, a dead giveaway that what we're dealing with is a ritual offering and not simply a broken water jar. To find out if the artifacts inside Cueva Cabrada are a symbolic sacrifice or just broken pottery, we have to get into the water and investigate. I'm finally ready for the big dive. Well, we're here at Cueva Cabrada, and we've done all of our homework. We've done our orientation dives, and of course, we finished all our training stuff on the mainland, and now it's time to get to work. 
Jeff, what's our first move? This is the map of Cueva Quebrada. This is in Chancana Park, the island of Cozumel. We're right here. This boat basin is this cutout right here. The cave runs right underneath us. And what we need to do is to swim from here to the pottery, which is all the way back here. This is a long swim. How far? Well, it's almost a mile. When we get there, how much time does that leave us to work? We're not going to have an awful lot of time to get to, to be able to do much work when we get there, and that's actually one of the concerns I have. So what's our uh, uh, what's our plan going to be to try and maximize that productivity? Well, actually, I have an idea that we can do this in two stages that may, may actually give us a lot of time to work in where the pottery is. Okay. We have seen some areas in here where we can get out, where there's daylight above us, but we've never gotten out because it's all jungle. Oh, so we don't know where the areas we are. We don't know where the areas are. If we get something close by where we can access from the, the interior of the island, and get it down to a reasonable distance, we can really get some time on the site to investigate what's going on there. We are swimming deep inside Cueva Cabrada when Jeff spots light from a small opening in the cave ceiling. If this opening is accessible from the surface through the jungle, then we will be able to cut almost 3,500 feet off our dive, several hours of swimming. This could be a great shortcut to the blind fish site, and it will give us more time to investigate the artifacts. The hard part will be finding this hole on the surface through miles of dense jungle. We're underneath the island of Cozumel, Mexico, deep inside the Cueva Cabrada cave system. After swimming for almost two hours, we are still over an hour away from the blind fish site. We decide to find a shortcut. Geologist Jeff Bozen has located a small opening in the cave ceiling. If we can find this same opening up top by hiking through the jungle, we will be able to carry in our gear and use this opening as our entry point for the blind fish site. Starting our dive from this opening in the jungle, rather than back at the main entrance of Cueva Cabrada, will shorten our dive time to the blind fish site by several hours and thousands of feet. Less time swimming and more time investigating will help us solve the mystery of how these Mayan artifacts from 900 AD <laughs> got so far back into this cave. How far did you estimate that we went? About 3,500 feet. So we found that uh, daylight out in the jungle. Seemed like a lot more than that to me. As far as we went, I was perfectly happy to call it a successful dive and turn around. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of time. And I don't think I'd want to do that every single time we wanted to get to the site. We've got a shortcut now, we're gonna take it. Even with a possible shortcut, swimming to the blind fish site is going to be a serious cave dive. Is it possible that an ancient Mayan could jump in the cenote that we're going to and have swum underwater to the place where the artifacts are found in the cave? John, that cenote that we found today is still more than a thousand feet from where those artifacts are. And the water no elevation doesn't play a role in this. There, the water would have been at the same level. The mines, there's no way the mines could have swum that or walked it. We still have to figure out how that pottery got there. So it was, uh, Geologists moving. now believe that the water table during the Mayan era was as high as it is now, which means that Cueva Cabrada would have been completely submerged and anyone trying to swim inside the cave would have had to hold their breath while swimming at least 1,000 feet, a physical impossibility. This mystery will take investigation on land as well as in the water. Yesterday, we were able to locate a spot from within the cave that we felt might have an exterior access that we could use. Steve went in, located that on the surface. I took your, some of your dimensions and compass coordinates and we took our old map and figured out to try to find a place off the road where we could cut a trail back. We were like 10 feet away and couldn't even see the water. And finally, we broke through and found the spot where the water was. And now, that puts the archaeological site that we want to look at 
within roughly a thousand feet or so. So that's a very manageable distance to get us there so we can actually do an investigation on the site. So to solve this mystery, Pilar Luna is the head of underwater archaeology at Mexico's National Institute of Anthropology and History. Pilar, do you have any theories as to how these artifacts got so far back in this cave system? Well, we have to find an entrance and, and uh, a connection with the surface because it's impossible for anyone to swim that distance to deposit all that pottery. Our time on the, the only way that we're going to solve this mystery is to divide into two teams. Jeff Bozanik and I will dive into an opening in the jungle floor and swim to the blind fish site. The second team will be Pilar Luna and Steve Omerod, who will attempt to find the area just above the site. Now, Steve, you did a real good job with hooking us up with this cenote here, so you're going to be a top side guy for this? Sounds like we're going to grab a machete and, and compass <laughs> and a GPS and, and head for the jungle. I'm so glad to be on the dive of <laughs> <laughs> This jungle is dense, and I can easily imagine getting lost. And that would not be any fun carrying this heavy dive equipment. Well, here we are. Here you are. But if you were to walk 20 feet in any direction, I don't think you can see this again. I'm glad to get that off my back. So, we'll get the GPS warmed up here. Let it find some satellites. Everything was like... Uh, At the cenote, we synchronize our watches. The whole plan depends on precise timing. Steve and Pilar will walk to the coordinates we think match the site and listen. At exactly 30 minutes into the dive, Jeff and I will pound a steel rod into the roof of the cave. There's no visible opening to the surface, but if Steve and Pilar can hear the pounding and pinpoint our location, they will be able to investigate the surrounding area and look for clues as to how the Mayans placed artifacts into the cave 15 feet below the jungle floor. This is it. This is the big dive. We're going to try and pound that steel rod up through the ceiling. Steve and Pilar are going to be topside, so if uh, everything's coordinated and works, we should be able to figure out how this stuff got there, solve the mystery, and that's what it's all about. That's why we're here. Let's go get wet. Enough of this. We're going diving. Okay. Start your watches. Okay. Uh, just as I go underwater, 30 minutes from now, be listening. Good luck. You too. Okay. We're off. For the plan to work, Jeff and I have 30 minutes to get to the artifact site. We'll begin pounding the metal rod on cue, hoping Pilar and Steve can hear it. This is the only way to positively determine the blind fish site from above. We need to go at least 50 meters more. When someone tells me that there is a pile of stuff on the floor in a cave, but they haven't found an opening, my feeling is you've missed the opening. It's got to be there. So one has to go looking for it. Hacking through that jungle is like trying to find a needle in a haystack because you don't know what you are looking for. I think we've got a clearing in another depression up here. See if we can get a reading on the GPS and see how our distance is. Well, our distance is just perfect. We are swimming to a mound full of Mayan artifacts inside a cave under the island of Cozumel, Mexico. How did they get here? After days of training and practice dives, I'm about to see the Mayan artifacts for the first time. As geologist Jeff Bozanik leads me deeper into the passage underground. Fellow cave diver Steve Omerod and underwater archaeologist Pilar Luna are almost directly above us. 
trekking through the Mexican jungle to find the surface location above the artifacts. When we reach the mound of debris, I'm shocked by what we find. There are artifacts everywhere. But we don't have time to investigate them quite yet. At exactly 30 minutes, we have to signal our location to the surface team. To do that, Jeff pounds a steel rod into the ceiling of the cave with hopes that the sound will echo up through the rock to Steve and Pilar above. Steve and Pilar use GPS coordinates to get as close as possible to the target. Okay, we've been waiting then, at the predetermined time, they stop and listen for the sound of Jeff pounding. If they can pinpoint the area directly above the cave, they will be able to tell if an opening ever existed above the artifacts. I think I hear something. Maybe it's Jeff. Yeah, he should. some tapping. I think we're here. This looks like this really could be it. See, Steve, this is this is a depression in the terrain where the water fill in. Uh huh. It should have been an entrance to the cave. And the that thing that's be... interesting about caves is they're fairly dynamic geologically. And particularly in Yucatan, what can happen with these cenotes is that they will silt in because the surface is fairly flat and water then comes pouring into these, bringing mud and silt and leaves and stuff. And the opening could be very easily sealed up. There should have been the entrance right here or, and through the ages, through the time it has been closed. But that, that will explain why the artifacts are just below here. So they would have revered this one area. Deep within Cueva Cabrada, we have no idea if Steve and Pilar heard us. But we want to investigate the artifacts, so we head back towards the mound. As I first approach, it looks like a pile of large rocks. As I get closer, I realize that some of the rocks are rounded. They aren't rocks at all, but Mayan pots over a thousand years old. Jeff finds a pot with holes on the bottom. These must be kill holes, holes punched directly into the pots to make them useless. There's no doubt that we are looking at Mayan sacrificial offerings, probably to the goddess Each Shell. Something catches my eyes. A rib bone. And then a long bone with a ball and socket joint lodged between some rocks. Perhaps these bones are remnants of human sacrifice. Anxious to tell Steve and Pilar about our findings, we head back to see if they found any clues on the surface. That's what I call a cave dot. Two big mouths. When you first look at it, it just looks like a big pile of brown rock. But as you start to look closer at it, you see all kinds of things mixed in with the stone that's part of this pile. Wow. I'll tell you what, that may be the most impressive thing I've seen underwater. We must have seen at least half a dozen pieces of pottery. All of those round shells that were about this big, I think, are West Indian top shells. Those used to be used for food. They may have been left there as offerings. We have the conch that were there. And aside from all that, you've got bones. Now, I don't know whether those are um, from uh, game animals or, or human bones or what, but I saw ball and socket joints. I saw what appeared to be ribs, uh, maybe even vertebrae. A lot of stuff in that pile. You are, Steve. Don't know how got there. Well, fantastic. Coral, uh, um, bones, pottery, conch shells. How did you guys make that? Well, we, we heard noise, so we think we, we found a very large dry pond or what looked to be like a, 
it looked like a spot that would be like this except the water's gone uh -huh. and there was a lot of soil I was able to get the machete down quite a few inches almost a foot down into the soil and as we know this jungle the soil is but, so but it was shallow. dry yes right. and you could hear pounding underneath yes. you yeah we finally heard it I wouldn't say I was standing right on top of you but but we were able to hear some noise through the limestone so this is going to be real exciting Pilar having looked at that site on the surface just for the short period of time you're over there what do you, what do you think what's your opinion the finding you just made and they found uh, Steve and I made in the jungle as a dry pound proves that this cenote was a sacred cenote and Mayas were using it as a sacred place for offering. We don't know from how far away they came or, or if there is a settlement nearby, but the offerings, the artifacts, are indeed an uh, indication of a sacred place to the underworld, underworld deities. So it's great. The kill holes in the pottery. The seashells a mile from the ocean. And the bones of what might be human sacrifice all had to have been deliberately placed inside the cave by the ancient Mayans. And because we discovered that there was once an opening in the jungle floor to the water below, we know that this site was once a sacred cenote. I would be willing to bet the house that the cenote closed up because the people left. These things are far too important to be allowed to fill up with junk while people live there. What I find is that these cenotes tend to be the essence of the village. Archaeologists will need more time to study this area, to look for remains of an ancient Mayan town that might lie hidden under the dense jungle. I've been fortunate enough to dive shipwrecks from the 1900s, the 1800s, the 1700s, even the 1600s, and I've always thought of those wrecks as being old, and surely they are. By comparison, the relics we saw in this cave system were positively ancient, more than a thousand years old. Now this is some extremely rich material for the Mexican archaeologists to work with, and who knows where these discoveries are going to lead. The thing about a really great mystery is when solved, it opens the door on other mysteries, and that's exactly what's happened here. There are underwater caves out there that no explorer has yet seen, and there are archaeological sites like this one still to be discovered. Seven hundred years ago, Timbuktu was once a thriving metropolis on the edge of this massive desert. It was a very vibrant place, a very cosmopolitan place. Now it's one of the poorest places on Earth. What happened to this city and the dozens of others that once thrived? The Sahara, tomorrow at 10 on H.I.